is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering The Novice by Trudy Canavan. Chapters 24, 25, and 26. In these chapters, Sania is being targeted. Being picked on is no longer the correct word. Being bullied is no longer the correct word. It feels that like they want Sania to die. Shit has getting, gotten way more serious than I was ready for. Way faster than I was ready for. Don't like it. Welcome to Spoil Me. Thank you, everybody, for being here. My name is Natasha, and this episode is brought to you by Patricia. Uh, Patricia has commissioned pretty much this whole book. So thank you to Patricia for that. Um, or no, shit, I'm sorry. This book was commissioned by Ashley. I'm thinking about Dark Lord of Dirkholm, which I'm recording right after this. Forgive me, Ashley. Um, Ashley has commissioned almost both books, like the entire series, practically. I think there have been about two episodes, maybe three, that other people stepped in for. Um, so many thanks to Ashley for being like so committed and generous to covering this so that I'm able to go through it and finish it because that's really um, the nice thing when it's not even as much about the money as you would expect. It's about me being able to follow the story more easily because there's not as much downtime between reading. Um, and it can really be surprising how much you forget if you leave something too long. So yeah, I want to just like throw a shout out to her and thank her for that. Um, so these chapters were really surprising in that I guess I expected, um, uh, I'm not even sure what I expected. I think because everything went so badly left with Akron finding out that Sania and Rothen and Lorlan all knew about him. And because of the torment that she's been enduring being removed from Rothen's care and being forced to live with Akron, I guess I was hoping that the payoff that we saw where Akarin is frightening enough to everyone and intimidating enough to everyone that Sania is pretty much left alone would hold. I just wanted there to be something to even out the misery that she's experiencing. She's got, you know, someone who's basically, she's basically being held hostage, but having to behave as if that's not what's happening and act all the time. And, um, when it seemed as if everybody was just going to leave her alone, I was like, well, you know, this obviously still sucks, but it's kind of nice that there's this side effect. And now that's not even a plus anymore. And I'm just like really saddened and surprised at how bummed I am about it, because I don't think I was even consciously realizing that payoff like meant everything to me. Um, because in truth... When it comes right down to it, I don't believe in my heart of hearts that Akarin is evil. And because I don't believe Akarin is evil, I have, like, as I recognize that Sania's perspective is very different and that she's experiencing very real fear and anxiety, despite me not necessarily agreeing with her assessment of everything that's going on, it's very real for Sania. So I'm not dismissing her experiencing that, but I don't think the danger is as real as she thinks. So for me, experiencing like this one misery, it's, it is extreme and it sucks, but it, I feel like in proportion, she spends more time with other students all day than she does in her rooms. So if I were her and I had to choose between getting along with my guardian 
and getting along with my classmates, I would choose the classmates. Um, and, you know, I, I keep having to remind myself that as far as she knows, Akron like wants to kill her. I don't believe that, but she does. So I have to take into account how the this might not even things out in her mind at all because she's so miserable in both situations. But what happens with Regin later is really, in, it's a lot. It's more even than what happened in the woods, not just because he gets through, but because he's doing this with with a really, like, he has a verbal purpose that he states here with, like, getting her out of the way and making her not take things that belong to us, which feels like a, that's a threat of another kind. This is no longer, I just want to put you in your place. That's, th it's beyond that. He says, I want to put you in your place to start, but. I felt like there was more to that sentence than he meant before. And I don't know if that's true, but the aggression here is really ugly and really, really hard to read. Um, so, all right, I'm going to back up. Sania is finishing up the winter break and she's really like kind of surprised at how bummed out she is. That the break is over because she wasn't particularly looking forward to it. For her, the classes are a means of getting away from Akron. So not having classes, she really felt like, well, fuck, I don't know what to do with myself now. But discovering all of these different passages and finding all of these like books that she enjoys has really made the time pass. And now that it's time to start classes again and be around a bunch of people who don't particularly like her, it feels very different than it did. So... I kind of like that because I'll find that happens as well. I'll be dreading something and then I'll realize that like things uh, have are, are way better than I thought. And then it comes to a point where you have to give up that thing that you didn't even want. And you're suddenly like, but no, I need this now. Um, I thought it was interesting. The difference between uh, Viola and Tanya, because Tanya is the servant girl of Lord Rothen who has been really friendly with Sunia and uh, you know, she's been very personable and looked out for her in a way that felt much more like, I don't want to say maternal necessarily, but just really personal. And this servant Viola is not really interested in like knowing Sunia and, or doing any more than like what she absolutely needs to do. And also Raka is this drink that apparently only slum dwellers really like. And um, the fact that Sinia asked for it, like Viola kind of ignored her a couple times before finally providing her with this drink and obviously doesn't really approve of it. Um, so that's another thing is the fact that she like feels free to express her, uh, what's the word? Disdain, I guess. Not, saying anything. It's the expression on her face that Sania can tell. This woman does not like the smell of it and doesn't think that Sania should be partaking in it. Um, and I was just trying to imagine a similar feeling, like a similar food or drink that, that somebody like us would have that kind of reaction to when we saw somebody consuming it. And the closest that I could come up with was something like Cheese Whiz. Where it's like, it's so far off the scale of what you even consider food. When you're somebody who has the privilege of buying real food a lot of the time, that when somebody asks for it, you're like, well, you can't really mean it. You just want cheese, right? But it turns out, no, they want cheese whiz. They meant it. It's just that that is so disgusting that you can't even like take them seriously when they ask for it. Um, and forgiveness, forgive me, anybody who's listening to this, who loves Cheese Whiz and feels personally attacked right now, but you should feel attacked because Cheese Whiz is disgusting and look at your life and look at your choices. Um, so that's how I, cause at first I was just kind of like, why does she fucking care? And then when I stopped and thought about it in those terms, I'm such a food snob. Like, of course I would feel this way. I don't know why I was like puzzled by it. Um, and 
Sania is like one of the things that is mentioned here that she did to fill her time was go to the baths, which, oh, God, does that sound good? I don't know how many of you all are are bath takers, um, but it does seem like that, like there are two kinds of people, those who love baths and those who think they're gross. Um, and. I am a bath taker. I love it. It's just so relaxing. When I'm cold, it's the only way to get warm um, that really works. I need to be submerged in hot water and that is about it. And the fact that this is all taking place over winter break adds to this feeling of real luxury and decadence to it, you know. Um, Relaxation allowed hunger to catch up with her and she visited the food hall next. A small number of cooks and servers catered to the handful of novices who had remained in the guild. Bored and eager to cultivate opportunities for future positions serving the houses, they encouraged these novices to request favorite meals. Though Sania had no high connections, the younger cooks indulged her as well, no doubt because of the inkle on her sleeve. So that's pretty fun. You know, once once this is all being described, I'm like, this sounds like fucking paradise. Like, this is Canyon Ranch, you know, she's fucking chilling in the hot springs in the morning. And then she's going and having a a luxurious custom made meal cooked for her. And then she checks out the university and does all of her exploring and making of her maps. And this is a really interesting development because we'll see later that she's like in class and that there seems to be some sort of connection with some things. So we will talk about that in a bit. Um, But yeah, and, and I love too the detail about how like when the break began, she was doing that thing where you like put off going home because you don't want to see the person at home. So she kept coming later and later home and hoping that if she left it late enough that Akron would be asleep and not bother her by the time she got back. But no matter what time she returned, he was always awake and waiting for her. So she gradually started to be like, why am I doing this to myself and trying to stay up so late? Like I want to be in bed and I'm going to meet him anyway. He's always there. So I may as well go home and get a good, decent night's sleep and make sure I'm home at a reasonable hour. And I, that is the sort of thing that I feel like I would do. I would test it out to see, is this, will this work? And then eventually you just kind of give it up because you're like, nah, he knows that game. He's not stupid. Um, so everybody starts uh, coming back after the break is ending. And um, she like doesn't really think about it often, but in moments like these is made much more aware of how many um siblings or not siblings children and um spouses are living on the property um which is something that i also forget because she's just thinking to herself how like when classes are going it's just novices everywhere i don't even notice these other people but when all of the novices are away on vacation and then people's like whole families start to come back from break it's really startling you know how much of a family atmosphere there is for a while so the things change after this because there is a winter, um, basically what what counts as like a, w- a winter semester where all of these people who start in the summer feel like the more traditional students, but there are some that for some reason aren't able to begin their study in the winter. And these students change the dynamic of everything. Um, and this is a really... Like, we haven't gotten any details on this, really, beyond knowing that Regin had some new sidekicks. We haven't met any of them or heard their names or had any description of who they are. Um, So I'm really curious if any of these new winter term students are going to be significant in any way, or if we just needed to mix things up a little bit and throwing some new people into the mix who are not as cowed as the other students who used to support Regin and have sort of seemed to fall back um, was necessary to keep the bullying going. But anyway, and I, I mean that from a writing perspective, you know, that we maybe want to add some new blood into this. Um, So yeah, then as she's walking, she's hearing them talking about her. That's her. Who? The slum girl. So it's true. 
Yes. Mother says it isn't right. She says there are plenty of novices as strong as her, ones that don't have a bad history. My father says it's an insult to the houses, and even the administrator didn't. The rest was lost as Sania turned into the corridor on the second floor. Pausing, she examined the novices in the corridor ahead, then began to walk. Unlike the first time she had appeared as Ocarin's novice, they did not stare at her. Instead, they looked once, scowled, then turned away. Eyebrows rose, and meaningful looks were exchanged. This is not good, she thought. So she goes into class, and this teacher actually seems to like her, Lord Larkin. Um, and that is a pleasant surprise, because she's sort of, I think, gotten used to the teachers taking their cues from the students in terms of how to teach her. And, you know, that's a pretty fucked up system, but it is sort of, I think a lot of teachers are tempted to believe that students know each other better than they will ever know the students. So if you want to treat someone the way that they should be treated, you look at their peers and it's a, like a, wrong. It's an incredibly flawed idea, but I do understand the impulse to believe that there are certain people who are going to have like an insight on a person that will be able to shorthand for you what would normally take half a year to discover. Um, and it's a shame, you know, I don't think all teachers are like that, but I can certainly see falling into that trap. But this teacher doesn't do that. They seem to actually like be interested in what she has to say. And also he doesn't make her like come and sit at the front of the class. Um, but yeah, he tells her the high Lord asked me to tell you, he wishes to see you after the next class. You are to return to his residence, which of course she's just kind of like assuming the worst. And it turns out as we find out later that Akron just wants to have dinner with her, but I am really not sure what that's about. If, if it's like he wants to be near her so that he can, um, read her mind in that surface way that he was doing with Laurelyn, where he didn't know what Laurelyn knew, but he knew that Laurelyn was hiding something and aware of something. And maybe it makes it easier for him to like sift through people's heads if they're sitting right near him. And you know, they're not having that much conversation. Like we saw that scene. So it wouldn't be too hard for him to focus on doing that while she's very relaxed, enjoying this amazing meal. So, that's the only suspicion that I have is that these like dinners are meant to sort of give him an opportunity to collect information and, and make use of her um, without her even really being aware of it. But I might be totally off here. So then this class is really interesting because Larkin is teaching them about the architecture of the guild. Um, and he says that Lord Lauren's early work was often unstable and ridiculous in appearance. He was considered to be an artist obsessed with making large, impractical sculptures rather than habitable buildings. But his discovery of the methods of shaping and strengthening stone with magic changed more than architecture. He began to make buildings that people wanted to live in. Uh, the university is one of his finest works. By the time Lord Lauren was requested to design and construct the new guild buildings, he was famous throughout the world for his work. The guild still felt it necessary to stipulate in their guidelines that he wasn't to use spirals in the design, something he was known to do in excess. However, the use of spirals can be found in the glass ceiling above the guild hall and the staircases of the entrance hall. From the diaries and records kept by other magicians of that era, we know Lord Lauren was a devious character at the best of times. Over a hundred years later, a magician named Lord Rendo wrote a book detailing the architect's career. I have included with the plan a few ex excerpts from this biography and a chronology of his life and works. Read them now. After class, you may want to look around the grounds at the buildings he designed. You will, as I did, see much that you had not noticed before. I will expect an essay on his work three weeks from now. So Sania, like, the, he, they're all given these maps. And Sania has been busy building her own map from her explorations and decides to, like, compare them to each other. Um, I'm trying to find the spot here. Okay, here it is. Um, 
The four towers at the corners and the huge room at the center were clearly drawn, as was the design of the glass ceiling, but the rooms and passages on either side of the main corridor were unmarked. She took her map out of her box and lay it next to the plan. After staring at both, she started copying the ceiling design onto her own sketch. As she suspected, the lines that marked the spirals in the glass met those showing the passages. Though the passage turns were at right angles, they combined with the ceiling design to form even larger spirals. So that's pretty interesting. Um, I'm always a fan of design having like a layered approach where I would like to design something that has this practical use, but I want it to look this way. And something like a building, there are so many more opportunities to include the, the like additional layers of significance to what you're putting together. So the fact that there are these other designs that tie in and create, you know, it's, I just think that's a really neat idea. I don't know what that's going to signify, if anything, if that's, if like, you know, spirals are like really significant in a lot of cultures as a symbol of life and like the cycle of life, the cycle of uh, reproduction, the sort of eternity of, of time and space, like the spirals have big meaning in a lot of places. And I'm wondering if there's not something about the way that spirals work that he included them in his design of this school because it helps with like the distribution of magical energies or something like that. I'm just spitballing here, you know? Uh, so her teacher comes by and sees her doing this and it's like, what girl, what the fuck is that? And she explains that she has been going and checking out the buildings while she's been on break. And, um, he tells her because she had been so sure that she was kind of going out of bounds and into like restricted areas. He tells her the only places in the university that are forbidden to novices are the guild hall and the administrator's office. Um, in the past they were locked, but as more space was needed, it was decided that the inner areas should be accessible to all. Senia thought of the disapproving look she had received from the magician she encountered the first night of exploration. Perhaps he had merely been suspicious of a novice wandering about alone. Perhaps he simply distrusted the slum girl. Yeah, that's an interesting, you know, like, it didn't really even occur to me that aspect of it. But when you've got, you know, if it, when there is somebody who has been profiled by practically everybody as being a criminal and dis like somebody that is, has the potential for stealing as well. I'm sure that's circulating. Seeing her wandering around in different weird areas of the university probably would get their attention. Um, so he tells her that he would like a copy of it and she's really relieved to be taken so seriously by him. Um, and she's not really sure why, if this guy is just like a better person, if there's something about him, um, but she's looking at him and then she turns and looks over and Regin is staring at her and she's just really struck by the hatred in his expression. And that is something like, uh, it's a, it's a really difficult thing to express on paper or in words. But when you have an encounter with somebody who looks at you in a certain way like that, it's just so upsetting because it fe it like can cut you down to your quick. Even if it's somebody that you don't give a shit if they like you or not, like you, you weren't invested in that, but the, the, the actual, like, it's almost a tangible thing, their hatred of you. And there's no defending against that. And that I think is, is the part that's so, it's just kind of scary, you know, um, because it feels like that energy can like reach out and touch you. So yeah, she starts thinking about how everything that Regin has done, every success that he has had has basically come on the heels of one of her successes. He has been trying as much as he can to one up her and pass her in terms of grades and probably in terms of like standing with teachers as well. And that was 
totally fine. Like it's not, she's not so competitive or so prideful that she needs to be number one, but it was very obvious what was happening. And now they're in a position where he hates her because she's the high Lord's favorite. And there is absolutely nothing he can do to pass her on that. There's not two high Lords. There's not, there's no possibility that the high Lord takes on more than one student. And probably, you know, I don't know how it's supposed to be four years of study or I don't remember how many years it is, but that's not like, I don't think it's really that likely that once the high Lord takes on a novice that he like sets her aside and starts with somebody new while she's still studying. I think that's kind of like, it might, you might be able to set somebody aside, but I don't know. We haven't really heard uh, anything about that. So, so yeah, this is just a really interesting moment where she's realizing that like Regin has always sort of been able to control his, his superiority and now he is experiencing being kind of helpless in that regard. And that's what's kind of eating at him, finally. Um, and then she sort of stops and wonders what Regin would have done if he were in her position. And at first thinks like, oh, he'd be so scared of Akron. And then really thinks about it and is like, you know what? I don't think he would. I think he'd be kind of into the idea of black magic. And I think she's right. I think that black magic is, it seems to be something that is basically like stealing power. And Regin is already getting bands of people together to feed off of their combined power. So that's not that far away, to be honest. It feels like, I don't even know where he got the idea that that works, but I wonder if there isn't a tie-in to the fact that he knows how to do this stuff and the fact that that serial killer who is wandering around is stealing people's energy. And I'm not saying that Regin is the serial killer. I don't really think that tracks. But maybe Lord Balkin is the one that has been teaching him. Um, and he is has been passing on to Regin how to you know, how to steal power without actually having to kill anybody um, or draw blood at all. So I'm, you know, I'm just spitballing here. I'm not really like super into this theory, but it's kind of stirring some things in my brain that get me asking questions. Um, so, okay, we have Daniel returning to the guild house and uh, meeting up with the other ambassador, Aaron, um, Ambassador Aaron. I don't think I even realized that that's his name, but that's really hilarious. Um, and he's talking about how like the voyage has not been super fun. They got in, they got caught in some storms and then Daniel goes to his rooms and, uh, gets several messages that came for him while he was gone and starts reading through them. So here comes the thing. The second guild ambassador to Eileen, Daniel, a family Vorin, House Tellen. It has been brought to my attention recently that some people believe you have spent less time attending to your ambassadorial duties than you have to personal research. Personal research is in quotes. You have my gratitude for the time and effort you have given to my request. The work you have done has been invaluable. However, to prevent further questions arising, I must ask you to cease your research. Further reports will not be needed. Administrator Lorlin. So this could read any number of ways. But some people believe you have spent less time attending to your ambassadorial duties than you have to quote personal research. This could mean everybody's talking about you and Tyand. And obviously you've been spending way more of your time hanging around and flirting with this guy that you like and not enough doing the job that I sent you to do. Now, I don't like, obviously Lauren, Lauren is once he finds out the high Lord knows all about everything and has spies out there. Of course, Lauren's just going to want to pull a plug. Like that's only natural. What's the point? Right. But including that specific sentence feels way less about like, all right, I think I need, I've got what I need. You're done now, which would be an equally valid message. Um, it, 
I'm, I can't help but feel like there's a bit of a manipulation there in trying to get Daniel to do something specific in response to it. And I just can't figure out what it is. Um, so, yeah, he's just kind of baffled at how abrupt this is and also a little hurt by it as well, because he's actually been having a pretty good time. He has this party that he's supposed to go to tonight. And, you know, really there's no reason to go now, you know, but he's still like, he's a very social guy. And I think he's just interested in the concept of ancient magic for its own sake at this point. Um, so yeah. He, and then he's comes across Rothen's note. Um, where Rothen says, I don't know if you've heard, but like Sania got taken by Acheron, which I don't really love. And he says, at Yaldin's suggestion, I have adopted a new interest to replace the old. You will no doubt be amused to hear of it. I have decided to compile a book about ancient magical practices. It is a task Acheron began 10 years ago, and I am determined to complete it. From what I recall, Acheron began his search at the Great Library. Since you are living close to the library, I thought I might ask if you would visit it for me. So this is kind of precious. Like, he's asking Daniel to do all this stuff that Daniel already did. And, of course, he has no idea that's part of why Daniel was sent there in the fucking first place. Um, and he tells him to be discreet and all this stuff. I can't help... Like, this... this Him asking him to, like, check out the library and all this stuff combined with the way that Lorland's message was constructed, where he seems to be accusing him of, like, having an affair with Tyend, I feel like maybe that's a mild warning? That maybe Lorland is telling Daniel, like, people are talking, avoid that guy, and, you know, not doing it because he's actually concerned about Daniel's reputation, but doing it because he has started to put two and two together on who some of the spies are. And he's hoping he can't tell Daniel, obviously, Akron is spying on you. Daniel doesn't know what he's doing is supposed to be. I mean, he he was told by Lorland to keep it between the two of them, but he doesn't realize how many other people would be interested in the fact that he he's doing this research. So if Lorland were to tell him, you know, I need you to stop talking to that guy because he's a spy, it would alert Daniel to a lot more of like the stakes at play here. And so arranging it to look like maybe avoid that guy because everybody thinks you two are fucking is a crafty way to handle him and get him to like maybe continue research, but like get away from the person that's reporting back on him all the time. I like this in concept, but obviously there's the caveat of how the fuck would Lorland know that Tyen is a spy? He wouldn't unless there's something that we haven't, you know, heard about that he's like, but anything that Lorland finds out, the high Lord is going to find out. So I don't, like that theory doesn't really work in the end unless there's something that I have missed that winds up happening that we hear about later or what. Um, so if you, uh, if you do not have time to do this research, is there anyone you have met who might be trusted with such a task? They would need to be discreet since I do not want to give the high Lord the impression I am investigating his past. I bet you don't. It would, however, be satisfying to succeed where he failed. I know you will appreciate the irony. Yours in friendship, Lord Rothen. Um, so, you know, Rothen, again, is still so far on the outside of what's going on here that when he writes back to Rothen, he's planning on being like, hey, buddy, don't take it so hard that she was picked up by the High Lord. Obviously, you must have done something right for him to even notice her because he's just so clueless. This poor sweet baby. Um, and then he starts to think about the fact that Rothen is asking for the exact same information that Lorelin had. And the fact that they're both like, don't tell anybody, be super chill about this. And he finally starts to ask the right question, which is basically, what in hell is going on? What is this about? Um, but, you know. There's only theorizing there. So he decides that he's going to go to this party after all 
because of what Rothen has asked him to do. I don't know how long he can stay out there. Like, if there's, you know, the way that Akron, not Akron, that Laurelin phrases, I'm going to go back and like look at the way it, it wraps up. Um, do, 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 where is it? Here it is. Oh, yeah. To prevent further questions arising, I must ask you to cease your research. Further reports will not be needed. So he's not telling Daniel that he has to come home. He and like, you know, he hasn't been demoted from being an ambassador. He just doesn't need to continue doing that. So if he can, if he just stays and keeps on carrying on with his research, that's going to have to get back to Akron and he will know Laurel and sent this letter telling him to lay off. So there must be another reason why he's continuing the research, which either Akron will figure out that Lor that, um, Brothen contacted him and asked him to help or Akron might think that Daniel knows more than he does because he is continuing despite being told to lay off. Um, so I feel like this is just all bad. You know, I just, I, I feel for Daniel being as in the dark as he is and not even knowing that he's in the dark, you know, he has no idea there's this whole other thing going on. He's like starting to pick up on something, but it's not really useful to like theorize on it. He doesn't have enough information on in any direction. So then we have Akron and Sania at dinner and it turns out that, uh, the person who is assigned to cook for him is like really, really gifted. Um, and she is blown away by the food and the whole time that she's been at school, of course, there are so many people who have complained in the food halls of like the food not being good. But we're considering where Sania comes from. She's just like loving it. So hearing them all complain was baffling to her. But once she eats this, she's like, oh, shit. If people ate like this frequently and then went to like the food at, at the food hall. No wonder it seems to be lacking for them. Like, God damn, this is unbelievable, which I really do enjoy because I've mentioned before how um, it can be hard for me sometimes to relate to Sania's complete lack of materialism. Like she likes to have things in for the significance of, of what they can do for her, the practicality of it. And just in, like enjoying something because it's beautiful or you know, even even something like taking the baths, she's only just starting to really relax and like enjoy. This is just not a common thing for her to let herself have a good time with something that is not um, that is more of a luxury, you know. So it was sort of nice to see this scene where like she f lets her guard down a little bit, despite being sitting with the person who is the most likely to do her harm, I think, out of maybe actually second most regents number one um that she's still able to be like jesus this is amazing so yeah and they start talking about her studies and he asks her how her classes in warrior skills are going and she says that you know she's just kind of not really into it and he sort of criticizes roth in here and is like you should have gotten extra training when it showed that you weren't particularly strong in this part of your education. And she actually sort of like argues with him about this a little bit and is like, I don't see why I need to worry about warrior skills. We are not at war. This isn't necessary. And Akron's like, girl, come on. You know that letting all of your skills go rusty in times of peace just makes you more of a target in times of war. You are going to lose like the guild will lose its power and its ability to cope with situations. If we just fucking sit on our asses during our, during peacetime. Um, and she tries to argue then that like, well, maybe that's true. And we should keep everybody prepared, but like, or we should keep warriors prepared, but not every magician needs to be a warrior. And this was really interesting um, because when she says we don't need every magician to do it, he says, don't we? And she just sort of sits silent. And then he says, 
Perhaps Rothen neglected that part of your training because you are a woman. She shrugged. Perhaps. Perhaps he was right. In the last five years, the few young women who considered becoming warriors were persuaded otherwise. Do you think that is fair? And as they're talking about this, this is when dinner comes in. So this isn't something that gets dwelled on for very long, but I really wish that there was a, an answer. I wish that Sinea was forced to give him an answer because I feel like I, the Akron is pushing her in a certain direction. And I'm very, very curious to see how that plays out. And if I'm even right about that. Um, so yeah, the, the food arrives and she's thinking to herself that it might even be worth having to suffer his company for food like this. When he then cuts into her, uh, her, I was going to say cuts into her thoughts, but in this book, that that's a lot more literally possible than it is in anything else. But he just talks and sort of interrupts her train of thought um, and says, I want you to dine here with me every Friday night. But I have evening classes. Takan is aware of the time allowed for your evening meal. You will not miss your lessons. She looked down at the empty bowl. But you will miss your class tonight if I keep you any longer. You are dismissed, Sunia. And she stands up and her fucking head is spinning. And she's gotten a little too drunk having wine at dinner. And also the dessert was like fruit that had been soaked in alcohol with something else. And she basically has gotten herself a tiny bit drunk. Um, so... Sania is um, heading to, let's see where, oh yeah, here it is. She is walking to her next class and she winds up like running straight into Rothen. And this is when we find out that he's like their number one chemistry teacher and that it would look really suspicious if Akron removed her from one of the top teacher's classes. So they're very confident that they're at least going to have a class together. But we find out later that Akron is already trying to throw a wrench in that. So I'm just a little sad for her preemptively because I know that this thing she's excited about is probably not going to happen. Um, and she's so emotional at seeing Rothen and thinking about everything that like has changed so quickly and how much she misses him. That when she start when she like rounds the corner to go to her classroom and she's running late, she sees Akron standing in the doorway to the classroom talking to one of the teachers and she hides. And unfortunately, the person who catches her hiding is Regin, who immediately clocks that she is afraid of Akron and decides correctly that he can come after her and she's not going to say shit to the guy. Because she doesn't want to involve him. And I, this kills me. Because I do not understand, not for a moment, why she doesn't tell Akron about what Regin is doing to her. Is it because she just doesn't want to owe Akron anything? Is it because she thinks that Akron's going to like mete out too harsh a punishment? Because now she thinks the guy's like into black magic? Or knows it. Um, is it that she. Like just doesn't like to be a snitch. I don't really even get that sense. Like I just am really not completely sure what's keeping her from telling. She doesn't want him involved. I, I guess is like the easiest way to say it. Because she doesn't want him involved in her life. So, okay, but like these people come after her so hard later that I feel that keeping her mouth shut could literally get her killed. And it's really frustrating to me that I'm not getting a good enough answer. Um, so then we have Laurel and talking to Akron and they have a little bit of a meeting where Laurel mentions how, um, how, Garrel wants uh, Regin to resume lessons with Balkan. And Akron's like, well, maybe you should let him because he's so angry and resentful of Sania. And it's got to be even worse now that she's my um, protege, I guess, that 
he is going to do something drastic if we don't give him like an outlet, which is so annoying. Like, okay, is that is that psychologically probably true? I'm tempted to think it is. But what pisses me off about it is just that whole culture of boys not having to suffer consequences for things. And even when they're told that they do have to suffer the consequences, it's going to be like a lighter consequence than they were promised and a lot lighter frequently. So I just, I feel like they're setting a really bad precedent here where they are letting him know that nobody takes it that seriously, that she got hurt or that he tried to hurt her. And not only are they like allowing him to resume a class that he was taken away for punishment, but that class is an attack class. So they're arming him more effectively. And this just kills me and I hate it. And I'm really mad about it. And the fact that Sunia keeps her mouth shut exacerbates this because she doesn't know, I don't think, that he's been allowed to resume classes. So her not saying anything is going to let him continue to get stronger as well. Everything is conspiring to give Regin all of these opportunities that he doesn't deserve. And it's just really infuriating to watch. Um, and also Akron says that they need to rearrange her schedule so that Rothen is not one of her teachers. Um, so Sania had a bad day. Like getting shaken up by running into Rothen and then seeing Akron and then hiding and getting caught by Regin has just thrown her whole head out of whack. So she doesn't have a good day in any of her classes. She just can't focus. And her warrior class goes especially badly. And she's walking back to the rooms when somebody like grabs her from behind and she reacts in this really like, you know, specific way. Um, a trick Sari had taught her flashed into her mind. The memory was so vivid, she could almost hear Sari's voice. If someone does this, brace your legs. That's right. Then reach back and... She felt the man toppling and gave a short laugh of satisfaction as he fell onto the floor. He did not sprawl on his face, however, but nimbly rolled aside and sprang to his feet. Alarmed, she backed away, groping for a knife that wasn't. Then she stopped and stared at her attacker in surprise. Lord Yikmos looked strangely unfamiliar in ordinary clothing. A plain sleeveless shirt revealed surprisingly muscular shoulders. He crossed his arms and nodded. I thought so. I may have found the source of your problem, Sunia. From your reaction just now, it's clear that your first response to an attack is physical. You learned that defensive manner in the slums, didn't you? Did you have a particular trainer? Um... Street fighting, defensive maneuvers, little wonder you use it first. It's what you know best, and you know it works. We have to change that. You have to learn to react magically rather than physically. I can devise exercises that will help you do that. I have to warn you, though, this kind of re relearning can be quite slow and difficult. Persevere, however, and you'll be using magic without thinking by the end of the year. Without thinking? That's the opposite from what the other teachers say. Yes, that is because most novices are too eager to use magic. They must be taught restraint. But you are no ordinary novice, and so ordinary teaching methods may be discarded. And I really like that, that he's that flexible to keep an eye on students that it's not really working for his method and figuring out why not and what about them makes something else more suitable to their temperament or their personality or the way their mind works. So then he says, I do want to talk to you, though, about the fact that you went for a knife. Now, you didn't have one, but your instinct was that you wanted to really hurt me, maybe kill me. And she's like, well, yes, like you were trying to kill me, it felt like. And he says, few would condemn an ordinary man or woman if he or she killed another in self-defense. But if a magician kills a non-magician, it is an outrage. You have the power to defend yourself, so there is no excuse for killing no matter what your attacker's intent, not even if the attacker is a magician. When confronted with such an attack, your first reaction should be to shield yourself. That is another good reason to change your first reaction to a magical rather than physical one. Um, 
You're not doing as badly as you think, Sania. If you'd struck out at me with magic or simply froze or screamed, I would have been disappointed. Instead, you kept calm, thought quickly, and succeeded in throwing me off. I think that's an impressive start. Good night. So, yeah, I liked that, that whole interaction. Like, he's just, he's really trying to understand who she is. And that's so important, you know, and also trying to build her confidence up. So, yeah, that whole thing is was actually really sweet. And I like, too, that it makes her stop and think about how ready she was to kill him. And the fact that she needs to he's right that she needs to unlearn that because she could just do so much more damage so much more easily nowadays um, because she, and and she will suffer really terrible consequences, like probably getting her magic blocked or something like that. Um, if she hurts somebody with her magic. So she's really careful to like think through what he said to her and consider whether it's true. And she finds it to be true. And I think that self-awareness will serve her well in life. Um, so, all right. Chapter 26 is when we have Daniel going to this, uh, this huge ball and he's going with ambassador Aaron and they are waiting in this enormous line of carriages to get inside, which it turns out there are three or 400 people that are coming to this event. So the line of carriages goes like all the way down the street because getting out to walk when uh, he says something about how we could walk faster than this, Aaron says, yes, we could try, but we would not get far. Someone would call us over and insist we travel with them and it would be impolite to refuse. So they decide to stay put so that they don't have to deal with other people, which I can relate to. And there are all of these like buskers um, who gather around this huge long line because, I mean, it's people who are trapped, bored and have money. It's really an ideal scenario to sell shit. So they are buying candy and like discussing things with each other. It turns out that in this area of Aline, children are really indulged and they they're going to be children at this party. They're allowed to come, which is something that Daniel isn't really used to. Um, so I really enjoy these like little, little bits of acknowledgement on how small things, small differences from culture to culture can still feel really strange. If you take for granted that the way you do something is the way everyone does something, something as simple as having a party and it's always going to be all adults. And then you go somewhere where they allow kids like, that's going to feel really weird. And it's not that big a deal, really, like in the end. But it's enough that you're kind of like, this is so I can't get used to this, you know. And I think it's often small things like that that we're less prepared for. If we go traveling somewhere we've never been, we're ready for a lot of like large cultural differences and, and that sort of shock that goes along with that. But it can be the very small things that you assumed would be the same that really kind of trip you up. Um, so I just, I kind of like that detail. Um, so this is when he winds up getting in the conversation of the woman who's um, hosting the party. Uh, her name is Bells. Um, what, what is her last name? I'm trying to, Bell, Bell, Bell Aralade exclaimed that her feet were already tired and drew Daniel aside to a bench seat uh, set within an alcove of the wall. So she just blurts out like, oh, he, I hear you've been researching ancient magic, which like, OK, I guess people just know that. Um, and D Daniel's a little taken aback by this, too. And then she starts talking to him about Tyand. And it's like women have found him a little bit disinterested. I was shocked. I thought that Daniel was just handling what's obviously a very carefully worded question about whether or not he knows Tyand is gay. And he answers her questions and I was kind of giving him all this credit for like, you're handling this really well. But then later when he talks to Tyan about the conversation, Tyan's like, oh yeah, I think she was feeling you out to tell if you knew. And Daniel's like, oh really? I'm like, dude, fucking obviously, what are you talking about? That's so clearly what she was doing. What, how are you this stupid? Daniel, come on, buddy, keep up. You're not an idiot. You have to know that. Um, so, you know, probably the fact that he doesn't know 
that that's like what she's doing at the time lends his innocence an air of sincerity that will probably serve him well in the end. Like it will turn out to be good for him that he was able to convince her so completely. But it really does shock me that he couldn't hear the subtext behind what she was saying and asking him. Um, so Tyenne comes up to him after this and introduces him to Valend of Gennard. This dude is not nice. Um, he doesn't really like take to Daniel. The second that he sees him, he like, there's a sort of vibe that Daniel gets when he looks down at him, the way that he like stiffens and stares at him just makes him feel like there's something about this dude that is, uh, hostile. And then in this scene, when they meet like face to face, he's still like just really stiff and weird with him. And he winds up going away and like, um, when they begin discussing books and he says something about how his own, his own interests are sword play and weaponry. And Daniel sort of thinks to himself, like, is that why I don't like this guy? Does he like somehow like subconsciously remind me of Fergan who might hate, but I don't think that's it. Or at least it's not most of it. I don't think, but I can't get a handle on it. I want this guy to like be revealed to be the, spy so that Tyend is not the spy because I don't I like Tyend. I don't want him cut out of this. But this dude hasn't really been around that much that we know of so him being the spy doesn't seem that likely. Um, so Daniel had like when he talked to Belle she told him about how Akron came and um, was so interesting and so attractive that she was kind of like enraptured with him and then when he left, he went to the mountains. And that's the first time Daniel's heard Akron ever went to the mountains. So when him and Tyann start talking about the uh, um, diaries and, and like visitor books that are in the library, and some of them talk about what's going on with Akron, and he says, I won't go into detail now, but they indicate that we may find more information in some of the other private libraries. I'm not sure uh, sure who or where. Do any of them live in the mountains? Daniel asked. Tyann's eyes widened. A few. Why do you ask? Um, so, yeah, he uh, uh, they they wind up like cutting off this conversation because what's his face comes back. Um, Valend. And Daniel thinks about how the way Valend walks even seems like weirdly predatory. But yeah, the whole thing is just sending all kinds of alarm bells off. So I'm curious about him. Um, so then we have Sunia, and this is the final scene of this section where she's helping out in the library and Lady Taya actually really likes her and appreciates her help. And she likes helping out in the library because, uh, on top of the fact that I think it just suits her personality to like be by herself and doing something pretty focused, she's learning where all of the books are located and, and what they are. And it's really helpful for her research and schoolwork. But she gets told that um, she has to head out to, uh, where is it? Um, a message arrived for you. The high Lord wants to see you in Lord Yikmo's training room. And of course she doesn't think twice about whether or not this is a real message. She's obsessing over what it could mean and why he wants to meet her there. But whether or not the High Lord sent it does not seem at all out of the question. It turns out that it's Regin. And Regin has a crowd with him. He has... I'm trying to see. Um, she recognized a few members of her old class, but the rest were only vaguely familiar. Um, I don't see a number, a specific number mentioned. Because it says a small crowd. And that could mean a lot of things. But they all start attacking her so that she has a shield up that starts to get run down pretty quickly because of having a shield in a circle. She backs up against the wall to make it so that she only has to shield like the front half of herself. But with them all hitting her repeatedly, it does eventually wear her down, which is a shame because I was hoping that whatever happened with in the woods was an indicator that she could like really hold her own for a long time. But this seems to start to wear on her pretty quickly. Um, and 
Regin is like goading them all into attacking her by saying like, uh, if you don't join us now, she'll get away just like she's getting away with taking what's rightfully ours. Are you going to put her in her place or spend the rest of your lives bowing down to a slum girl? And when he, when everybody seems to be like sort of hesitant, he then says that he will take full responsibility if they're caught, but he knows they won't be because she's not going to say anything to Akron. So they all join in and eventually once her shield is down, he hits her with a sun strike and every, like a lot of people are not thrilled with this. Um, hearing like, I've always wondered what sun strike did. She heard Regin say like to try it. Hearing a sound of disgust, Sania felt a momentary hope as two of the novices exchanged a look of dismay, then turned and walked away. But the others all wore eager expressions, and her hope faded as sunstrike after sunstrike sent pain coursing through her again. And I just, like, I, I had the same, like, oh, maybe everybody will, nope, they're all super excited to do this. And she just kind of has to curl up on the floor and deal with the pain and wait for them to, like, get tired of doing this. And later on, Lorlin finds her, like, struggling to walk home. She is so weakened that she can barely even, like, stand up. And he is able to piece together what happened. And she begs him not to say anything to Akarin. But we know that Akarin is able to see and hear everything that Lorlin sees. So Akarin has to be aware of this. And I'm really curious what he's going to do, if anything. I'm really, really curious. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. And I'm just really, like, disappointed. And I don't mean like disappointed in the writing or just, you know, but just the fact that it's turning out that she's still going to be picked on like this is just such a bummer. Um, so, yeah, we'll see what happens next. But I'm just like kind of sad. And I am out of time also. So I'm going to wrap this up. Um, thank you again to Ashley for commissioning this. And I am really looking forward to the next episode because I'm just I really just want Akron to like do something really clever to stick it to Regin. And I don't know what that even looks like, but I don't know that he would do that. So we'll see if that even happens. Um, thank you guys again so much for listening and I will see you soon with a new episode. Spoiled Network Podcast.